In my journey to become a better filmmaker, and particularly a camera operator, you have to be familiar with using a variety of different systems. Now, I've used a bunch of different cameras in the last few years, but there's one camera I've had my eye on, and Sony Canada was gracious enough to let me borrow this guy for the last couple of days. Now, we are gonna be talking about the Sony Burano, but I don't necessarily want this to be a review, but more so everything I learned from using the brand new cinema camera that Sony offers. We'll, we'll get into it. have this camera so I think it's worth talking about the design of the Sony Burano itself and to be honest with you from using the FX line cameras everything that I felt like was missing out of the FX6 3 and the 9 are all in the Sony Burano except they are gonna charge you which we're gonna talk about a little bit later now I totally thought the learning curve on the Sony Burano was gonna be a little bit more complicated however everything looks exactly the same as the FX6 menus now, I didn't do a lot of tests on the in-body stabilization. However, one thing that I did notice that you can use in-body stabilization even for PL mount lenses, which is something that's new. I use the Dezito Vespid Primes and we did use them a little bit on the wide angle and you do get a slight bit of jiggle on the corners while using in-body stabilization. However, if you do need it, it's something that you can use at your disposal. I also wanna add down to the autofocus, the autofocusing system works pretty much the same way as the FX6, which is another thing because a lot of cinema cameras don't have a handy autofocusing system. You'll probably see it throughout this video because I used a mixture of lenses, but honestly, when using the autofocus on this guy for situations where you need it, it actually comes in handy and works just fine. I love the fact that there's gonna be the onboard audio that's gonna be in there. And you have two XLR ports that are three pin instead of five pin, unlike the Venice one, which I don't think I'm ever gonna stop complaining about. You're also gonna get things like built-in NDs, the autofocus as well. But I also really like the fact that a lot of the IO is already built into the camera itself. One thing that I didn't necessarily like about having something like the Komodo X is I had to buy extra accessories to get things that I would have gotten from a more run and gun style shooting camera. Also nice that it has a V-mount plate as well, so that way if you wanna have extended battery life because it does take up a lot of power with everything that's in it, you have the ability to do that as well. But I find that it's just a bigger, heavier, more robust version of some of the FX line cameras, and they put everything in the body to minimize how much stuff you actually need. One of the things that I will say is, albeit it's not the same size as the Venice, it's not a light camera either. So you wanna make sure that you have the proper support, especially when you're gonna be using this guy. But at the price point that it is, and the level that it's gonna be at, I think you're gonna be just fine. Obviously, with an expensive camera, everybody wants to know about the image quality. If you're going to read off the spec sheet, the Sony Burano shoots at 8.6K at 30 frames a second at full frame. However, if you want to go up to some of the higher frame rates, you are going to have to crop in a little bit on the sensor. Now, that might throw off some people, but it's actually pretty commonplace, especially when you're working with raw footage. The Red Raptor, the Red Komodo kind of do the same thing. Because you're working with raw sensor data, you might have to increase the crop on your image. However, when you're coming back from an 8.6K sensor, as you crop things down, you might not lose as much quality as you think. If I wanted to get all the way down to 4K 120 frames a second, I'd have to crop down all the way to Super 35. However, 4K coming down from 8.6K is kind of like the a7 IV coming from a down sampled image. Also, if you want to get into 60 frames a second, you have to go down to 6K and there's something called a full frame crop. It doesn't go all the way to Super 35, but it does take off like a couple percent. But at the same time, it still looks really good and most people in 6K aren't gonna notice the difference. Oh, you are gonna be able to use XOCN LT. Now, one of the biggest questions I got asked while using the Sony Burano and shooting a little bit with it was about the image and more so the image compared to other cameras. Now, if I was to tell you that it's drastically different from using an FX9 or an FX6 or an FX3, I, I would be a liar. But at the same time, if you're equating solely the price point to image quality, you're going to run a miss. You're not necessarily giving the camera a fair shot. Certain cameras are going to have other things to do with their workflow, which it actually certain cameras are gonna have things that are gonna be for their workflow much less than it is gonna be for their image quality. Now, that's not to say that the OCN LT is any slouch. It actually looks incredibly good. Now, the first day that I try to compare this to a Sony FX3, which has the same sensor as the FX6, 
I actually got a little bit upset. I started grading similarly to how I grade most things, especially fitness content. And when I went to bed, I was a little bit upset because I thought they looked exactly the same. And then I kind of slept on it, realized I was sleep deprived, woke up, and when I looked at the image, they were different from each other. The colors are going to be slightly around the same kind of zone. However, I did find, especially with darker skin tones, if you don't get things right in camera, even at 10 bit, you have that kind of over under when you're going a little bit too green or a little bit magenta, and it's a little bit harder to move back and forth. Just so we're on the same page here, the OCN LT raw is still a 16 bit color space, which means you're gonna have a lot more colors to deal with, which means you're gonna have a lot more colors to adjust your image to. And at the same time, especially working with darker skin tones, you're able to dial in things the exact way that they should. You also have to keep in mind that there isn't going to be any processing in camera, which is going to give you a little bit better of an image in terms of the Sony Burano. Cameras like the Sony FX3 have built-in noise reduction and sharpening, which might make the image look a little bit crunchy, at least when you put it right beside a Sony Burano. However, that's not to say that your Sony FX3 suddenly is a bad camera because it's stacked up beside something that's 10 times as much. I'll also add in, at the end of the day, I feel like Sony's more of an ecosystem company, so if you make cameras that are so drastically different in image between each other, well, you're not really doing anybody a favor because I might not be able to use some of those other cameras in order to work in the same workflow in a multi-camera situation. If I made the Sony FX3 and the Brano so far apart in terms of the image, in terms of your color grading and how it processes things like dynamic range, you might actually be in a position where it's gonna be harder to match up those cameras when they're used in a variety of different situations together. Now, I don't have a lot of notes in terms of the dynamic range and the low light. If you want to see more of an in-depth version of that, you could just go to CVP and watch that. I'm not necessarily going to pair it exactly those things, but I feel like both of them are going to be great. Personally, for me, my litmus test for both of those things that if I am in a room with a window in the background, does the window blow out? And if it doesn't blow out, then I think the dynamic range is just fine because most of the time, especially on a system like a $25,000, $30,000 camera, you're probably going to have your scenes lit. You're probably going to have people that are going to handle your lighting. So you're probably going to be able to fight around that dynamic range. I actually don't know how many stops are in this camera. On top of that, in terms of its low light, I think the same is going to be true as well. You have 3200 and 800 as your dual base ISO on the Sony Brano, which is a little bit different from an FX3, which goes up to 12,800. However, there hasn't been a situation where I've needed to go to 12,800. And also when you are at that high base on the Sony FX3, you do lose a little bit of dynamic range when you are using that ISO to compensate for a low light situation. However, on the Sony Brano, it kind of looks exactly the same if I'm using 800 or 3200. I don't notice a gigantic difference in the image, in both the situations, it looks really clean. Albeit, you can light things fairly simply because in the lighting scene for a lot of the tests I did, I just used three Nanlite Pava tubes and it worked just fine. And otherwise, the room was completely blacked out. Now, with all that being said, a lot of people had asked about in comparison to other cameras that can do RAW as well, particularly the Raptor and also the Blackmagic 6K full frame, which are two cameras that I've operated on and one of those two that I own. And I'm going to say that out of the box, if I'm just looking at the image on its own, no, I don't think any one of them is better than the other because for, because for the most part, if you're exposing properly, you're lighting properly, and you actually have some color blocking going on, and you invest a lot of things that happen before you press record, pretty much everything is going to look good. I don't think that, especially on a platform like YouTube, you're going to immediately be able to see the difference between two cameras that are going to be expensive as these guys are. And on the note, on the Blackmagic 6K, it does shoot in 6K RAW, which looks amazing. And it's very hard to tell the difference between RAW images kind of across the board out of the box. If you have a decent colorist that knows how to do their job, you're going to make any image look amazing. I don't think comparing something like a Red Raptor or a Sony Brano or a Blackmagic 6K or a Sony FX3 coming out of the box, unless you're someone who knows really how to push an image, is a fair assessment if anything is worth the money based on what the camera looks like. We all can say that we're decent at color grading, but when you put it in the hands of some professionals or when you put it in the environments that the camera is kind of made for I think the results are going to be a little bit different which is the reason why I don't really want to try to convince anyone to buy this camera because it might not be made for your workflow and if you're someone that's happy on an fx3 or an a7 IV I don't think there's anything I could say to convince you to spend the extra twenty thousand dollars Now we are going to address one of the elephants in the room and that's going to be rolling shutter because that was quite literally the most asked feature that I got about this camera. And I would be a bold face liar to tell you that there isn't any rolling shutter. There definitely is. And if you shake your camera side to side, you're going to notice some rolling shutter. However, as somebody that shoots a lot of action, a lot of fitness, I shot a lot of dance stuff as well using this camera, 
I kind of didn't notice and I kind of didn't care. This is coming from somebody that also has a red Komodo X, which has global shutter. And I will say when I'm shooting handheld, it does look really nice and the movements feel very natural. However, when I was shooting on the Burano, which sometimes I did shoot some handheld, mostly because it's heavy, I didn't do it too much. I didn't necessarily notice a gigantic difference in the wobbles in the corners. I spent a lot of time watching movies and I'm sure you guys have as well. And you've probably watched commercials. And at no point did I think that all these cameras that did have rolling shutter was somewhat a detriment to actually the commercial itself. I find there's gonna be certain situations where you're going to need rolling shutter. For example, if you're shooting fast moving cars or virtual production, those people already know what their devices are gonna be made for. They're going to buy the faster readout camera that's going to give them what they need. But what I think was what you give up on the Sony Burano is that you're gonna have a bit of rolling shutter, but you're also gonna have things like built-in NDs, dual card slots. You're gonna have the XLR on the body itself, and it's gonna be part of an ecosystem that could work with a majority of different cameras in the same pipeline. I think for the most part, the second that some global shutter cameras became a little bit more affordable, it somehow became the standard of what a camera needs to do to, in order to become like a good camera. But I find that if you're going to be somebody that's going to use what this camera is intended for, I don't think you're going to notice. I kind of don't think you're going to care. And if you're going to be shooting in handheld, the image is still going to look really good. Now more on that, I feel like some of the discourse on the internet ends up becoming the Honda Civic drivers complaining about what Tesla should do. And if you're not somebody that's in the market for these cameras, I, I don't think it's something that everybody should be looking at to be completely honest with you. That also includes myself. I have no interest in keeping this with me. However, I wanna use it as something that I'll rent whenever I have a film project that actually warrants me having it. Now, there was two reasons why Sony Canada actually let me borrow this camera for as long as I did. One of those things is that as a camera operator, I am gonna be working in May with the Creator crew, and I'm gonna be operating on the next short film that we have. And the second one is actually gonna be a little bit interesting. Sony not only invited me, but they also had me as one of the instructors for the Burano demo and a video workshop over the last couple of days. There was a ton of people at this event, and we actually got to teach a lot of things about the Sony Burano and also how to use a two light setup in order to have a game time interview. Now, if you guys want to know more about that or more about this kind of setup, you could always leave a comment down below that I was really humbled about was out of anybody they could have picked to lead this video workshop, they had me teaching a camera that honestly is far out of my scope in terms of what I would normally use. But the fact that they have this guy that does YouTube a bunch and camera operates every now and again to actually teach other creators how to use this thing was actually an incredibly humbling experience and it was a lot of fun. I got to connect with a bunch of different industry professionals and other aspiring creators as well. And being able to build a community around a common interest far past is just doing the typical gear review, quote unquote. There's a lot more things that go into some of the technology that we use for our jobs and the ability to be able to speak on that and trade notes with other people around the industry I think far exceeds the actual importance of the camera itself. But a special shout out to Sony for actually bringing me on these workshops throughout the week. And this is also the second reason why I got to use this camera, which was really fun. If you're somebody that is working on bigger production, someone that's working with larger budgets or someone that's working with a dedicated crew, the Sony Brano has everything that you need in order to limit the barriers for the workflow perspective and the ecosystem that this camera is gonna provide. However, if you're someone that's shooting on an FX3 or an FX6 or those sub $10,000, $5,000 cameras, there's not a lot I'm going to be able to say to convince you to spend the extra $20,000 for what the Sony Burano provides unless you're in that same ecosystem. This goes across the board for every single camera. A lot of the times, once you get into the upper price tag of things, those people that buy those cameras already know what they're buying them for, and they don't necessarily need to be convinced, and honestly, there's nothing I could say on YouTube that's going to convince you to go from an FX3 to a Sony Burano. And if there is, I'm going to leave an affiliate link in the description down below, and I'll take myself out to lunch. However, I don't know if a lot of people that are watching these types of videos are going to find that value in that $25,000 price tag. You're gonna get a lot of the way there on your Sony FX3. You're not necessarily gonna have 16-bit RAW or built-in NDs in some cases, or have built-in audio on the body itself. At least those things aren't going to be cheap. However, if you are somebody that is happy with the camera you have, I don't want this video to function as something where you have to take out a line of credit to buy a camera body, because that's never a good idea. Now, on the flip side for the people that do have those type of budgets, maybe you're working in those Netflix or high budget documentaries, or you just have a little bit of money in order to spend it. You might want to rent this for your productions and as your production become more regular, well then go ahead and buy this camera. But again, if you're using something cheaper, you're gonna be just fine. A new camera releasing doesn't necessarily mean that the one you have is suddenly garbage. And albeit that the Sony Burano personally for me checks all of my boxes, they're, they're gonna charge you. And whether or not you're willing to spend that amount of money, well, that's up to you. That being said, 
said, a special shout out to Sony Canada. They've lent me a whole bunch of different camera gear to try out and also to make a lot of educational content for you guys so you know how to use the gear that you end up purchasing. And as well as letting me lead an entire video workshop, even though I was probably one of the more underqualified folks to be there, at least argumentatively. But they've given me a ton of opportunities, like renting out the Sony Burano, in which I can tell you my thoughts about it, which I think it's an amazing camera. It just might not be within your workflow and your price range. That being said, if you guys want to see more videos, we're kind of back on the grind now. I spent some time away, but I'm going to leave another one over here, and there's a ton of videos coming out later. But I'll see you in the next one. Peace.